Welcome to my sewing room. We have some beautiful things for you today, made both on the machine and the serger. My friend Pam Mashey has brought some beautiful samples. This has uh, shadow work embroidery by machine, little strips down the front. And what I really want to share with you, you see what looks like a beautiful double needle pin tuck? Well, this is done on the serger. We have another beautiful and very elegant blouse, which has machine embroidery on the organza top and then some wonderful little uh, stones that have been sewn in also. The serger bias strips are really very interesting to me, and Pam in a few minutes is going to show you how to do them. This wonderful vest was made, and here are bias strips on this vest, and these bias strips are made on the serger, so you be sure and hang in here with me because it's a lot of fun. Now this vest features an overlay of organdy done in this beautiful, done in the direction that's very interesting and has magnificent machine embroidery done on the organdy. And if you'll let me turn this around, I'm going to show you just a little special touch that Pam has done on the back. We have the little machine embroidery right at the top of the back of this wonderful vest. This blouse has also decorative stitching and embellishing done on the serger. These strips, it looks as if there are one, two, three, four, five. It looks as if there are five strips on this blouse. Not so. The strips were just embroidered and these, what, this wonderful embellishment was done on the serger just on one piece of fabric. Won't you come over to the technique boards with me and we'll begin to share some of this magic with you. I have some beautiful clothes to share with you and so many serger tricks to share. First of all, this skirt, which is one of the patterns for our series, was made totally on the serger. The matching jacket has the most wonderful serger trims. It's just absolutely fabulous. You can see the beautiful metallic threads and the decorative stitches. And then the blocking, the next block has wonderful beads that have been stitched down on the serger. And I think my very favorite part, come over here and look at these. Uh, it's almost like ribbon has been made on the serger. It's been woven over and under and over and under. Such a wonderful designer look. This magnificent heirloom blouse has some really special techniques on it too. This, the puffing was done on the serger and it, it was uh, stitched down two times, but let me show you this. The bias trim was made on the serger and then decorative stitching was done on the sewing machine in order to attach the bias trim. To make this wonderful serger puffing, which is certainly quick and easy, you start with a piece of fabric for the, for the puffing portion of the blouse and you run three gathering strips. Here we go. One, two, three. Something that I think is absolutely fascinating is uh, bias binding that is made on the serger and the bias binding is then attached to the puffing strips which were done on the serger and it's attached with, a sewing attached with decorative stitches on the sewing machine, not with the serger. I'm so pleased to have as my guest today my friend and business colleague Pam Mashey. Pam is Director of Education for Baby Lock USA. Pam, thank you for coming to be on the show today. Well, thank you, Martha. It's a, always a pleasure being here. <laughs> and let's just show you the technique that Martha was showing you on the board. First of all, what we will want to do is have the lines drawn on the piece of fabric and have the length of fabric double the length of your finished garment. We're going to take our serger and we're going to run rows of stitching using the cover stitch and the differential feed. That's what creates that puffing look. It's and again, beautiful. On, thank you, mm. and all three lines. Once we have those lines stitched, we're then going to take our attachment to make our narrow belt loop binder. This is a great technique. I've used fusible thread on the chain looper as well as using the wash away thread in the needles. With the wash away thread in the needles, you give a puff of steam when you attach it to your puffing piece as we did here, and you'll notice that the lines will go away. We're then going to take our decorative stitches on the machine. As you can see here, there's quite a variety of stitches in order to choose from on the machine. Simply place this piece of fabric centering it under the presser foot, and we're going to start to stitch right down the center of our puffing strip. Now that's going to attach it in place, 
and again just a little spritz of water or a spritz with the steam will make those lines disappear. Those extra lines of stitching that's on our tape. That is absolutely magical and you can choose any kind of decorative stitching you want to go yes, on that. Yes you can, yes you can. Let me show you that on here. See how pretty that is? That is beautiful Pam. And now we have that technique completed. Once we have that technique completed, you're then able to insert that onto your garment and you're finished with your, your puffing strips. That's Very what I simple call and really, easy. That's what I call really easy puffing. Yeah. And the finished result is beautiful. And Pam, I also love the fact that you've put a few little pearls on here. Right. Now, I right. guess those were attached by hand. Yeah, those we did do It by might hand. be a little hard to get these right. tiny pearls, but mm -hmm. just to, this is a magnificent, and I also love your beautiful uh, the wing, your needle. wing needle entredeau right. that you have used to right. attach this puffing strip to the mm -hmm. blouse. Mm -hmm. Pam, thank you so much for sharing this technique. And I also will share with you that Pam has a garment construction tip for you. This wonderful gourd skirt, which is one of our patterns mm -hmm. for the series, Pam has done an interesting technique for you. She has hemmed the circular type hem using the serger. And also, she has a trick for you to share how to ease in that fullness. And right. I think that's wonderful. I can remember circular skirts being difficult to hem from the time I was in high school up to present. Okay, Pam, show okay. us what you're going to share. Well, let me show you one technique here. First thing we're going to do is use fusible thread again in our lower looper with the serger. We're going to increase our differential feed on the machine. And what that's going to do is it's going to ease in that fullness around the circular hem for us all by, our, by itself. And we won't have to do anything but then just turn it up and press. So all we're going to do is surge around the edge. And can you see how it gathers that I can see edge that. or eases in? It doesn't really gather it, okay. but it eases in the fullness of the hem. Okay. Okay. Now look how it's cupped in that hem edge for us already. All we're going to need to do then is lay down the width or the height of the hem. We're going to simply take our iron. We're going to press it in place. And I must tell you that if you don't have time to hem before you're running out the door to wear your garment, <laughs> this will hold itself in place long enough that you could wear oh your garment goodness. and then come back and hem it that, later on. That is, abs okay. that is absolutely fascinating. And that's all there is to and gathering that extra there fullness is to do on to this wonderful in. skirt, which that's has a right. very wide hem, hem line. line. <laughs> that's right. And would take us a while to ease in all that fullness. So the serger does that for us. Pam, thank you so very much for You're being welcome. here and, and for sharing your wonderful techniques. It's always a pleasure to see you. Thank you, Mark. And next, I have a quilt square for you. I think you're going to love this quilt square I have to share with you today. This quilt square, we call the Techniques French Waterfall. Now, you probably know how much I love lace shaping, and this is the lace shaping. It's a scallop, which we call the French Waterfall. I have a curved lace shape and a miter lace shape on this particular technique. We also have another technique, which I think is really pretty, which are the curved pin tucks. Now, there's also another technique, which is to insert another color of fabric in between the French waterfall or basically the lace shaping. Come on over here and let's see how to do all these different techniques which go together to make that beautiful square. First of all, let's shape some lace. Now, as you can see on scallops, I have a curve and I have a, I have a miter. So I've pinned one side of the curve, and by the way, always use glass head pins. And I'm going to show you why in just a minute. I, to make a miter, I put a pin at the top, a pin at the bottom. Then I will fold the lace back on itself. Try to keep my arm out of the way here. Remove the pin that is on the inside to put it through two layers and watch what happens when I bring it out. A perfect lace miter is folded in. All right, to come on around, I put the pins on the large side of the curve and I come all the way around and I will repeat that on the whole set of scallops. Now, in order to make this lace lay down, I have a little lace trouble here, don't I? French and English laces have a gathering thread built in right here on the edge and the one that makes a scallop on the top is the easiest one to pull. So I have already pulled this little piece of lace that's built into French 
piece of a little piece of thread that's built into the French lace, and it's just like magic. When I pull the thread, can you see how beautifully the lace just lays down flat? Now, I'm going to take the iron, and I'm going to give it a little shot of steam, and you might be saying, uh-oh, Martha, you put the iron down right on those pins. Well, guess what? That's why I use glass head pins. It is a necessity in heirloom sewing to use glass head pins because I iron right on top of them. Okay, after I make the two pieces, the two blue strips, and I put my lace on four sides, excuse me, on four places, then I will come in and trim away. I will come in and trim away the fabric from behind the scallops. Now you can see what's beginning to happen here. We have two pieces, and it, as on our little sample, it has the green strip in the middle. After I trim them away, okay, let's see what happens next. Then I put the green strip in between my two, my French waterfall. Now then, the next step, of course, will be to zigzag or pin stitch the green stitch inside. Now, can you see there? It looks like I have a French waterfall. Now, I promised you I was going to share with you how to make those wonderful curved and squared double needle pin tucks. And I'm going to do just that right now. But you know what? Wait, hey, hey, hey. We may just go ahead and let you see them first. Let me just show you what they look like. When I say curved and squared pin tucks, I mean a pin tuck that comes this way, stops at precisely the point you want it to stop, and then comes on around. Once again, stops and turns around precisely where you want it to turn around. And this is kind, these are kind of called magic pin tucks, but I'll tell you a little secret. It is not hard to do. The first thing I'm going to do is to draw a line that bisects that point where it's going to turn around. Then I put my double needles in. <clears throat> By the way, I'm using a 1.6 or a 2.0 double needle. I have my stitch length set on a very short stitch. Oh, 1.5, 1.6 will be good. And I use a needle down position. I do not use stabilizer for double needle pin tucks. Now, I have all those things set up on my machine, and I'm going to follow the line I have just drawn. Now, when I get to the line, the point where I need to turn around, where the double needle straddle, let me get one more little stitch in here, where the double needle straddle that turnaround line, then I'm going to leave the needles in down position. You remember I told you, I'm going to lift my press of foot. I'm going to twist. Oh, Martha, you say, what do you mean? You're twisting and your needles are in the machine? Yes, that's exactly what's happening and it's going to be perfect, so don't you worry. Then I lift it and I twist. I lower my presser foot and a perfect turnaround double needle pin tuck is found every single time. Okay, let's do this again. I'm going to sew around on the line I drew. Remember, my needles are in down position. I'm going to come to where the double needle straddle that bisecting line. Let me see. I think I need one more stitch. Yep, one more stitch. Then I'm going to leave the needles in the machine. I'm going to lift my presser foot. I'm going to twist, and nothing is going to happen. It's going to be a perfect turnaround every time. I'm going to twist, lower the presser foot, and I'm going to finish sewing this curved and turned around these perfectly scalloped double needle pin tucks, and that is the secret. Those are all the secrets. Now let's go back and look one more time at these beautiful curved pin tucks I've just shown you how to do. You curve it, you let your double needle straddle the line, leave the needles in the machine, lift the presser foot, twist it, and come around again. And that is just how easy it is to make those wonderful curved and squared pin tucks. And now we have some silk ribbon embroidery by hand for you. I'm so pleased to have as my guest today my very dear friend and business colleague, Beverly Sheldrick. Beverly is one of the most outstanding needle artists in the world today. She has published and, and publications all over the world. And by the way, she is here to be with us today from New Zealand. Beverly also teaches at the Martha Pullen School of Art Fashion in Huntsville and writes a lot of articles for So Beautiful magazine. Beverly, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. You know that I just love being here with you. It's such fun. <laughs> Now, today, Martha, I would like to talk to your viewers about the irises that we have in the center of these uh, double needle uh, 
squares, which I've, it's, it's another variation of that lovely tumbling blocks thing that it seems to be in my head at the moment. But I've been just having such fun with it. And at first sight, there's not a great deal of difference between the two, but they definitely are different, the two irises. So I'm just going to show you how they're done. And really, it's my old fa favorite. We're starting off with a tortured fly stitch this time. <laughs> we have here on the, I've drawn a normal fly stitch because I wanted you to be able to see just what I was doing to it. And in this little drawing here, you can see it a little more clearly. So instead of I've dropped one side and I've squeezed one side, and you can see I've got a sample of it here. And of course, you will see instead of having a long tail like this, making it a Y, we have just a very short one. And that's like a little tunnel. We're not going to pull this little section too tightly. And you can see I've got one here. I have then taken my needle, I've come up over here, and I've given it a pair of angel's wings. So here they are going through there like that. Now, the one thing that is important when you're putting these little angel's wings on is to remember not to make them, making them uh, a mirror image. We do not want a mirror image or a pair of handlebars. <laughs> we want something that's a little bit uneven. So if you drop one side, then take the other one out to a different angle. And the other thing that is, I find that students make the mistake, they tend to make the top cup too big and in this section here isn't big enough and it looks somewhat like a startled rabbit. <laughs> we don't want startled rabbits. So you can see here I've got these two made here. Here's the one that I've just been talking about and this is the second one that I'm going to discuss in just a moment. So we're just going to do a little bit of work first of all on this. You can see there's my tortured fly stitch forming the, the top or the cup of the iris and then instead of putting my needle in down here I'm going to put it in just down there and that will just I'm not pulling it too tightly and I've got another one here we'll just put that in through there like that and then where you can see I have my needle here it's quite a distance below there and I'm just going to slide it through that little cup that we made and then I'm going to put it in on the other side and you can see there's a totally different angle. Now you'll also notice that I have a twist in the ribbon here. I'm not worried about that. I just feel if a twist does happen and I don't do it deliberately uh, then it just adds to the shape. Now finally, for the stalks of these irises, and it is both the same for both of them, I am just going to roll my ribbon like that before I put the needle in like this. So we'll just come up there like that and then I will come up again like this over to here and then we'll put another one in down there. And ladies, you can vary the angle of the, these leaves. We just want them, again, uh, just, just sitting there. Now, we'll just spend a moment on the second one. You can see with this one how the, the cup is formed by a lazy daisy stitch. So there's that cup, first of all. And then we have, when we take this side through, we're instead of going under a, a little tunnel, we're just going to poke it in underneath there like that. And you can see how this one has been finished. Don't pull them too tight. We want them just sitting loosely. You can see how this one is here. Now, the other thing that you need to remember about this iris is this, that here's we're doing our lazy daisy like that. Now normally with a lazy daisy, we would put our needle in right beside like that. Our rib, it would be right beside our, win, our ribbon. But we're going to give it a little point. So we're just going to elongate that a wee bit like that so that it's just sitting up there 
like that. And then we're going to come across like this. And perhaps I'm a little bit big there, being over fertilizing my iris. <laughs> and then just sliding it through underneath there, like that. And then, as I say, a different angle and usually a different length as well. So there we are, we have our iris there. We would then just do our stalk and our leaves in the same way. One thing I do want to say about this stalk, and that's this, a mistake I find that ladies and gentlemen usually make is they don't get this stalk long enough. And that's why when I do a stalk, I like to start at the top here because it allows me to get the proportion correct. And the, it should be roughly two and a half to three times the length of this iris up here. And of course, they look wonderful if you like to do as I have on the blouse I'm wearing and just have a bank of them going all the way around. Oh, it just makes me so happy, Beverly. My mother loves iris, and we uh -huh. always had lots of iris in our yard, so that just makes me very happy to see that beautiful <laughs> iris stitch. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Beverly. Won't you come along with me to my attic? This dress is one of the most beautiful pieces in my collection. As you can see, it's white with a little bit of pink and green on it. Very unusual Swiss Batiste fabric. I'd like to start at the very top and just share some of the fabulous details on this dress. First of all, at the top of the neckline treatment, there's a wonderful piece of silk ribbon which is attached to the lace by using tiny little French knots, hand embroidery. Then look at the way the dress is is made in the front absolutely beautiful we have a little bit of the bridging stitch the hand bridging stitch here and then the beautiful lace work begins a wonderful uh, lace bow is on the front I'd like to hold this sleeve out for you too and let you see this the gorgeous lace bow on the sleeve and you know one of the things I adore is the fabric the little pink that just peeks through at the bottom of the sleeve it is so pretty there are three pieces of lace insertion and then four pieces of lace edging which have been attached to a piece of netting to, to stitch that gathered lace edging down so feminine and so pretty then the skirt I'm going to hold this skirt up for you so you can see the whole skirt. Do you see how these wonderful bows have been st stitched on all the way around the skirt? And believe it or not, there are even more bows on the ruffle of the skirt. I just have to imagine that this was a graduation dress or even a wedding dress or a very special party dress. Now let me turn it around and let, let you just take a peek at the back absolutely beautiful lace shaping and even a little silk ribbon bow and the bows go all the way around the dress all the way down to the floor. For our Sewing from the Heart today I have a letter here from Susan Adams of Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania. Dear Martha, my daughter Beth and I have been sewing triangular head scarves that tie those kind that are very popular with the young girls in my daughter's fifth grade class to sell at a craft sale at her school. The projects from this sale will go to support the school spring service project Habitat for Humanity. This is my daughter's first sewing project and she is having the time of her life. The story gets better. My dear mother-in-law was an avid seamstress and when she passed away three years ago, the family sent me all of her sewing related articles. I was unable to throw anything out and there were many, many boxes of scraps from her years of sewing that were included in these boxes. Dear mom was from the depression and couldn't throw any fabric out. And you know what? I identify with that. These scraps and bindings are the fabrics that we've used for these head scarves that we're making. My mother-in-law was also a volunteer for Habitat for Humanity and would be thrilled to know that her scraps will be used for such a wonderful cause. Not only has my daughter started sewing, but she's able to remember her grandmother as well. Thank you, Susan from Pennsylvania. And I'd like to thank you for coming to the sewing room today. <laughs>